God is so good. Let me just tell you. I love it because I always have, you guys are probably so sick of me saying this, but I always have this idea of where the study is going to go that week, right? Like last week, I knew that I wanted to start teaching uh, about David's wives. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be awesome. So we're going to start. So I start studying and I'm looking at, you know, this one's life and this one's life and the little bits that are said about this one. And I had this whole, by the end of the week, by Friday of last week, I knew where the study was going. So I'm like, okay, I got this. So then Sunday comes and I go to start typing out my notes, right? And as I'm typing out my notes, they're getting so convoluted. Like I'm starting with my introduction and my introduction is now like three pages long and I haven't even gotten to the point of what I'm trying to say. And I'm already like looking at my kids and I'm like, I've been at this study for an hour sitting at my computer and I don't know where to go now. So now I'm just like, I go back to this other part and I start typing this whole thing. And then the Lord starts flowing through this one wife of David. I had originally thought we were going to cover all of David's wives. That was my plan to just kind of highlight all their lives and do like, this was this person and this was this person. But as I'm doing this one, I'm like, oh man, Lord, you have so much to say right here that doesn't have anything to do with these other wives. So I'm like, okay, good enough, we'll slow it down. And instead of having 21 pages of notes where you guys like end the study going, who are all these people again? And you're like, wait, what was with? I'm like, let's just go slow. So we're going to slow it down and we're only going to handle one of David's wives today. David, from what I can find in scripture, he had eight of his wives are named. Now, he had more than that. <laughs> and at least 10 concubines on top of that. Um, a Lord today. What's a concubine, mommy? Uh, I'll explain it later. No, I kind of gave her the idea. It's, it is a wife. You know, she's not allowed to sleep with anybody else. It's not like she was a prostitute or anything. But she wasn't quite a wife. She didn't quite have the standing or the um, uh, preeminence that a wife had or even all the rights a wife had. But she was treated like a wife. And she wasn't allowed to marry anybody else or sleep with anybody else. So it's still like a wife. But anyway, we'll get into that later. Uh, in any case, the Lord constantly surprises me with where he takes this study, so we'll just see. Obviously, he had something else to say tonight, so that's where we're going to go. Go ahead and open your Bibles uh, to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and while you get there, I'm going to give you some background, okay? The time of the judges has ended. The people of Israel wanted a king. Now, this wasn't necessarily a good request. God wanted to be their king. They, he wanted their nation to be totally different than everybody else, where God was the one who led them and guided them and told them what to do. But the people weren't having that. All the nations around them had kings. They wanted to be like everyone else. So God gave them Saul, right? Saul, the first king of Israel. He was everything the people wanted. He was tall and handsome. He was built like a king. He was a warrior like a king. He fought some of the battles and God let him win. So they're like, yes, he is the one that we want. The problem was in his heart, of course. If you go through these Old Testament books and you're reading through these men of God, you come across some like Saul who was chosen by God and gifted by God and set up in this position by God. And then once he was there, he didn't want to follow God's way. He wanted to do it his way. And Saul, who started out so humble, hiding, right, did not even, didn't want to show up even for his coronation, um, turns into the kind of guy who it's, it's all about me and my way and I'm the king and it didn't work out very well. Enter David. David was a young man, not related to Saul, had nothing to do with Saul. He was a common shepherd boy, didn't have lines of nobility or anything. Um, and yet God chose this boy to be king. He was anointed while King Saul was still king. Uh, and so it's an interesting time in scripture when you get there where Saul is still king, but God has departed from him. And God's no longer blessing him and his spirit's no longer on him. It's now on this boy David, right? And we see David grow up and he becomes this, you know, the champion. Everyone knows the story of David and Goliath, right? Where God helps him to beat the giant. We even sang about it. Um, but uh, God's spirit is now with David. Now, David, we're going to learn a lot more about him as we talk about his wives. Because you can't talk about a wife without noting something about her husband, right? They're connected. <laughs> so we're going to learn a little more about him too. Um, and most of you know uh, a bit of David's story. He's so disappointing. 
You want so much from this man who God has just blessed and he loves the Lord. If you ever read any of David's Psalms, he wrote 73 of them. 73 of the 150 were written by David. And he had this poetic heart and this love for God. And yet, holy moly, David was a a flawed man, right? We're going to talk about that a little bit too, but uh, we're going to look at his wives because this is a women of the word study. We're getting our our main context from them. Uh, Again, we know the names of eight, uh, and we don't know the names of the other ones. While David had sought to please God, he was a human being, and so were his wives. Um, I don't know why we tend to expect perfection from people. We know the saying, right? We know nobody's perfect. Everyone knows that. And yet, we still expect certain people to be perfect. You know, when you have a hero or a mentor that you look up to, you expect them to have these standards that truly are unattainable. We're not perfect, right? And it's funny when you're connected to that person that someone else sees as perfect, and you go, oh, (laughs) I could tell you, right? I know if, like, you know, there's be like, oh, Andrea teaches Bible. like, none of you guys are fooled, right? None of you think I'm perfect because, whoo. Remember that one time I swore during Bible study? <laughs> yeah, that was another story for another time. Thankfully, we weren't online or anything at that point, but uh, we didn't record it. No one can prove it. But um, I definitely have my moments. And uh, it's so funny, though, that we don't expect that in others. We just want them to be, you know. And then you see a pastor that falls, and they fell into some kind of sin, and we're like, oh, how could they? Well, because they're human. They're just like you. They mess up. And they're, you know, publicized for it because they were so, you know, up in front of everybody where you and I who aren't, you know, we get to hide it a little better than they do. But um, it, it can be depressing. Anyway, I digress. Today's story is about a princess named Michael. Uh, some people say her name Michal, Michal. I don't know. I'm not Hebrew. I always heard her name as Michael, so I'm going to just say Michael, okay? Uh, let's see what the Lord has to teach us through her story. So the setup 1 Samuel 18 is where we're at. David at this point is probably in his late teens. He's already defeated Goliath. He's already been anointed by God. He knows one day he's supposed to be king, uh, but he's not. Um, He's like best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. uh, And he's been playing as a musician in Saul's court for a while. Because David, you know, from the Psalms, the songs of Israel, right? We know he was a gifted musician. So he's been playing in the court for a while. He already knows that uh, Saul doesn't like him very much. Because a couple of times Saul has realized who David is. He knows David's been chosen. He knows that David's supposed to be the new king. But Saul is not going to give it up to him. He's going to fight and claw his way to try to maintain his power as long as he can. One of those ways is by trying to murder David every once in a while. (laughs) So it's this weird story. And you're like, why would David stay? And I I don't know. I don't know what was going on at the time that he still felt comfortable playing for Saul again, you know, even after Saul threw a spear at him a couple times. But um, he does. Now, the women love David. The, the Bible says that he was, han- he was ruddy and he was handsome, right? I picture him as this, I don't know, ginger, warrior. <laughs> I don't know. They said he's had red head, right? Something like that and freckles. I don't know. Maybe it's just my imagination. But he's a good-looking guy. He's like the hero of Israel. He's the, the A-list celebrity in Israel next to the king and his family. Um, and he's also very gracious, you see, when David defeated Goliath, when, when they were waiting for someone to step forward and beat Goliath, Saul had made all these promises. Whoever defeats Goliath will, not only will his father's family never have to pay taxes in Israel. Could you imagine if that was a benefit? Hey, guys, if you do this, you never have to pay taxes on anything again. How many people would go for that? Yeah, right? Uh, but the other benefit was Saul was supposed to give his oldest daughter, uh, her name was Merab, she was supposed to be the prize, right? It's kind of like the tournament of kings renaissance thing where you get the princess if you win the whole battle. So that was a promise. Well, when David beat Goliath, one, David was like 15, and Saul's daughter was probably a bit older than that. So David was like, uh, no thanks. (laughs) But he also was like, I am a common shepherd kid. 
I have no business being part of the king's family. So when Saul gave his daughter to somebody else, you know, David just kind of wrote it off. He didn't worry about that. But Saul had another daughter, this princess, Michael, his younger daughter, okay? And she had a thing for this celebrity boy warrior who was in a, amongst her household a bit. So in 1 Samuel 18, we're going to pick up in verse 20. Uh, the Bible says this. Now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him <laughs> and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today, right? The first time he said it was with his first daughter and then he just flipped the switch and gave her to somebody else. But this time he's saying, it, all right, you're gonna be my son-in-law with this daughter, Michael. Can you believe that he called his daughter a snare? He's like, she's going to be a trap for him. <laughs> now, I don't know if he's talking about her personality. I mean, some of us can tell with our daughters growing up, dang, girl, you're going to be a trap. <laughs> you're going to trap some boy someday, and that's a poor boy, right? You know, some of those, <laughs> I remember my mom telling us that a couple times as girls growing up, oh, man, your husband better watch out, right? But he actually meant it as a, he was going to set a real trap using Michael. Okay, so verse 22. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Communicate with David secretly, and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am poor and lightly esteemed man? He's very humble. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner David spoke. Then Saul said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but, okay, this is where it gets weird, 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Okay, pause here for a second. You guys know what foreskins are? Okay, they're part you know, of a man that doesn't see the light of day much, right? Okay, so can you imagine that being your dowry? Like, it's like, hey, you want to get married? I need 104 skins of my enemies. I'm like, huh, this is a different culture, just a different time, okay? Uh, I don't think my dad asked anything like that of Mark when Mark asked if he could marry me. Um, very different times, but that's what, that's what Saul says. Now, Saul's thinking, if someone goes to get these foreskins, they're not going to want to give them up, right? So they're going to try to murder the person who's trying to take their foreskin. So David's going to get murdered. Like if David goes to do this, basically he's making Michael the bait in his trap. If David goes to marry Michael, then he's got to bring me, you know, basically kill 100 Philistines. And they're not going to want to die, so they're going to kill him, and he's going to be dead, and then I'll be fine, right? My problem will be solved. Well, he underestimates David. And he, <laughs> Saul, he always thinks he can fight against God's will. He thinks that even though he knew God had picked David, even though he knew that his time is ending, he thought, he kept thinking, I can scheme my way out of it. I can figure out a way out. Well, of course he never does, but uh, <laughs> let's see what happens with this bride price. Um, verse 26. So when the servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore, David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to the king. <laughs> Can you just imagine him counting them? <laughs> oh, uh, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, as a wife. The thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. So Saul, his plans don't work, right? And, and Michael gets to marry David and David gets to marry Michael. Um, <laughs> Michael loved David. Michael's father, however, did not. He feared David 
and he counted him as an enemy. Now, David had made a, he, we don't know how David felt about Michael personally. We know that he was in favor of this plan to marry her and become the king's son-in-law. I don't know if it was political. You know, again, David knew that he was supposed to become king eventually. And maybe it's just a supposition, okay? This is me and my imaginations as I'm thinking this through. There's a possibility that maybe David married Michael and that wasn't God's will for him. Maybe David was thinking, if I get in here, this is how I become king. I become linked with the king's family. I've married his princess daughter, and that's how God's going to work. I'll just go do that. We don't see David asking God about this. Lord, should I? (laughs) Obviously, the Lord was with him, and the Lord allowed it to happen. But part of me wonders, Was this God's plan, or was this David trying to finagle his way into the king's family? I don't know. I'm not real sure. Um, Maybe he really did love Michael. That could be part of it, too. I mean, she's enamored with him, right? She just loves him. Um, It could be a two-way street. I don't know. Um, But we'll keep going. Again, the Bible doesn't always give us everyone's feelings on the whole matter. It's not a dime store novel, right, or a, a romantic fiction you know, book. We kind of just have to go with what scripture says. So they get married. It continues. It may sound like a fairy tale at the beginning, but this is real life. And in real life, marriage is hard. Marriage has a lot of factors to it. Any of you in this room who have been married, just go, mm-hmm, 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 right? Especially if there are family conflicts. I don't know how it was for you guys. I am the most blessed person on the face of the planet. I don't know anyone else who's ever been married to their best friend whose parents are already best friends. When I married Mark, like, our parents were already best friends. They go on cruises together, like, without us, that have nothing to do with us or our grandkids or anything. My parents and his parents are like, Tight, right? I don't know how that happened like before prearranged marriage days, but for most people, it's not that easy. When you get married, you meet the in laws, right? There's whole movies about that and the terror of meeting your future spouse's um, family. And sometimes it goes over really well and you just instantly fit in and click and praise God for that. And sometimes you never do through your whole life. You just, oh, it's always a war. Um, That's pretty much how it was for David and Michael. There was no like, hey, come on over for Thanksgiving, right? This was not that kind of family. Um, In fact, Michael's father wanted to kill her husband. (laughs) And it wasn't like the shotgun father kind of picture. Like he literally was constantly throwing spears at him. I mean, trying to murder her husband. (laughs) Do you think that caused some conflict within the home? It sure did. We're going to see a big instance of that right here. at this point, like I said, David had been a musician and had been tried to murder a couple times. Um, uh, in this point, where we're going to pick up, we're going to jump up to chapter 19, right here in 1 Samuel. Um, Saul has once again thrown a spear at David, and David runs home. The problem is, Saul knows where they live. <laughs> okay, so we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel 19, verse 11. It says, Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, if you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a cover of goat's hair for its head and covered it with clothes. Ferris Bueller, okay? She Ferris Buellered, uh, with David right here, okay? So when, <laughs> it keeps going. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he's sick, you can't have him, sorry, he doesn't feel good, he can't come to the kingdom right now. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michael, why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? 
And Michael answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed at Naoth. This is a very interesting story, right? We see Michael basically save David's life. She lets him out the window and then covers it up for him, right? Uh, But there's some problems in this story. There's some things I want to point out that the Lord was really just showing me as I was studying through this. Uh, Some definite problems here. Now, I'm not going to talk about the problem of her lying, saying he's sick to save his life. That's a whole nother discussion for another day. Is it right to lie if you're saving someone else's life? There are very different answers for that, and I honestly think that's something only between you and the Lord. There are cases in the Bible where people are honored for lying and saving lives. And God rewards them. So I can't always say, no, lying is always, always, always a sin. And yet I've seen other instances where someone told the truth at great cost and great sacrifice, and the Lord still made it work out because they told the truth. So I think that's something you need to work out in your own heart. I'm not going to talk about that problem. But my first problem that I see here is that Michael had an idol in the house. Did you see that in here? When it said that she used an image and put it in the bed and covered it with goat's hair. That word for image is the word teraphim, and it's used as an idol. She had an idol available in the house to grab it and put it in the bed sheets and make it look like it was a human being lying in there, and it was David, right? And I'm thinking, whoa, why does David's wife have an idol in the house? Household idols were very common in this culture. You prayed to them before meals and you did all that stuff. They were your household gods. Now, some people, as I was studying, they tried to say, oh, you know, the same word for she took an idol could also mean she procured an idol. I'm like, it's the middle of the night. Where is she procuring an idol? It makes more sense and seems like she had one on hand. That's just what it looks like here. And I think it gives us a little insight to her spiritual Uh, state where she was at now while David loved God and served God wholeheartedly I think Michael maybe didn't her dad didn't her family wasn't real strong and tight with the Lord and she brought that into her marriage a relationship where she loved and worshiped David but she didn't necessarily love and worship David's God another thing where I wonder God was this really a marriage made by you I'm not real sure but in any case uh, and it begs another question, did David know? Did David know his wife had an idol in the house? We don't know. We have to leave that one up for speculation, but hopefully he didn't. But if he did, it wasn't the worst mistake he ever made. <laughs> we can look at the rest of his mistakes later. But in any case, we have a glimpse into her spiritual life right there. My second problem, not that she lies to protect David, but the second lie she told When her father says, why did you let David go? He was my enemy. We could have taken care of this. And she said, oh, he made me do it. (laughs) Right? She makes it sound to her father as if David threatened her life unless she helped him. She lies again, this time not to protect someone else, but to protect herself. I can't ever find an instance in the Bible where lying to protect yourself is ever okay. Lying to protect another, that may be different. But lying to get yourself out of it, mm -mm, I don't think so. She made Saul think worse of David. Granted, her father was crazy. He was. He was insane by this point. He'd actually even already tried to kill her brother in one instance. Uh, But she seems to be acting purely out of self-preservation and at David's expense. She puts her husband down to lift herself up. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been in a group setting where someone's questioning maybe a decision your husband made or something and you throw him under the bus? (laughs) Oh, well, he, he just, silly man, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. I have. I remember recently I had to come up to some of my friends and apologize later to say, oh, Earlier, when I was saying this about my husband, that was not very gracious of me. I made it sound like he was just a fuddy-duddy, whatever, and didn't want to be involved in something. That was not a very good way for me to present him and make myself look better in the process. 
And it's not just with husbands. When you do it with someone else and you say something to put them down to make yourself look better, you know, it may have saved Michael from her father's wrath for a moment. But truly, all it really did, she allowed a little crack in her relationship with her husband. She, when you allow that, you allow a split. You're, you're splitting your loyalties between who you're lying to and who you're lying about. And that split, sometimes it's, you know, you say you're sorry and you ask for forgiveness. You, you can repair them. But sometimes splits, man, we all know where they can lead. We're going to talk about another split in just a minute. So being really careful never to put ourselves up for the sake of putting someone else down. Um, I put on here, wives, what are you allowing others to believe about your man? And are you slandering in front of him in front of others to make you f- feel better about yourself? Don't do this. All right, it's a crack. So speaking of cracks, here's my biggest problem with this story. <gasps> Why didn't Michael go with David? She let him out the window, and she let him run away. She should have gone with him instead of staying home. I think, oh, no, she had to stay back because she had to tell the guards so that he had time to run away. No, because later in this chapter, if you keep reading through chapter 19, Saul goes straight after David, and God totally miraculously delivers him. God didn't need Michael to lie for him. God would have saved David. And I think, I know if she would have gone with him, God would have saved both of them, miraculously, the way he saved him anyway, right? Was it because, now this is speculation, the Bible doesn't say, so I'm asking myself questions, right? Why didn't she go? Was it because she was too much of a princess, used to the life in the palace, you know, worried about, Uh, the roughness of the outside, right? I don't know if any of you guys have rough husbands who like to go out in the wilderness and live and whatever, and you go, have such a good time, honey. I will stay here and have a cup of tea and turn on my Netflix, and you just enjoy, right? Uh, I am so grateful my husband's not a hunter. Even if he was, great, I would be one of those stay-home wives. I am not We started camping. Okay, I love camping. Camping is so much fun. We did a lot of camping when I was a kid. Now, the camping I did when I was a kid is totally different than the camping he did when he was a kid. I am from San Diego. So camping meant you took your, we had a tent, and that was okay, and then we had a tent trailer, but you took it to a reservation campground place that had showers and potties and a beach and... You know what I mean? Shops. I mean, <laughs> it was like a cheap hotel. Like, you maybe, yeah, you brought your own sleeping bag, but, like, you had, you know, gra- you know pavement and people. And one time we, when Mark and I were first married, we went beach camping with my family. And he was like, what is this? I mean, there was a train that, like, went through the campground, too. <laughs> and he's like, every 10 minutes, was like, <gasps> I'm like, it's just a train. And he's like, why is there? train we're supposed to be camping and I'm like what do you think camping is so then I went camping with him one time in Moab it was free camping I'm like I didn't know there was such a thing as free camping he's like no there's such a thing as he's like how do you not know there's free camping I'm like we didn't free camp okay it was cheap camping but it was like you paid something because there was a pool and he's like oh no there's a river I'm like okay that sounds nice so we go and it's like no it's a tent and you're like Mm-hmm. Of course, I had a stomachache that night because I get stomachaches all the time. So we spent half the night at the Denny's back in town because I'm like, I can't go back there. There's no, like, nowhere to do anything. So eventually, finally, like last year, we bought our own. We didn't camp forever when we had babies because I'm like, I'm not taking my babies out camping. That's just, they're going to fall in a fire pit or, you know, a cactus patch. Like, let's just wait until they're old enough to, like, live. So then we got a tent trailer, but I told them the one thing, I'll go with you anywhere, honey. I will follow you anywhere, but there has to be a bathroom. There has to be a bathroom. So we bought a tent trailer that has this cute little porta potty. It's great. Now we can camp anywhere. And I'm like, okay. But do you see what I'm saying? Some, some men just like to rough it. And I don't know if Michael said, uh-huh, I'm not a rough it kind of girl. So you run off and I'll wait here at the palace. I don't know. Maybe that was her thinking. The problem is with that 
is if that was her case, she chose her own comforts over her husband. <sighs> That's not a good thing. Ladies, I don't know what it is that your husband does that you go, <laughs> for my mom, it's bowling, right? My dad is a bowler. <laughs> and my mom's like, do I have to go to bowling again? I don't like bowling. I don't want to bowl. But let me tell you, for what? Six years, my mom's been on his bowling team because my mom's like, all right, I'll be your woman on your bowling team. Today, this, or this year, she finally gets to just go watch him bowl. <laughs> but I love that. I always told my mom, mom, you're such an example of going and doing that thing your husband loves to do. And I think, man, if only Michael would have gone with him and not chosen her own comfort over his. Now, might be your husband's like, please don't go with me hunting. <laughs> <laughs> your perfume alone will make sure that we never catch anything. I don't know. Or you're so loud. Please let us have his time. I'm not saying you have to follow him everywhere he goes. But I'm saying if he ever asks you, hey, do you want to go with me somewhere? You know what your answer should be? Yes. I would love to. Just give me a potty. Okay? <laughs> All right. You can have conditions. Just be willing to go. Okay? Be willing to give up your comfort for your husband. And I'll tell you what, that'll speak volumes to him. He'll let you get away with a lot. He really will. <laughs> if you just, honey, can I just have, oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I'll make sure it's all right. He does. My dad bought my mom a bowling ball and bowling <laughs> shoes and a bowling bag. And <laughs> my mom's got more bowling paraphernalia than she ever thought she wanted. But dad tricked her out. Now he's trying to get her to golf with him. We'll see if that ever happens. But she's like, I'll drive the cart. Just don't make me golf. <laughs> right? Um, choosing your husband, right? Um, the other part in it is, I wonder, well, maybe she didn't stay back for comfort. Maybe she wasn't that much of a prima donna, like I picture her. But maybe it was for her family. This is her father we're talking about. This is her brothers and sisters and her family, right? Maybe she said she just couldn't leave them. If so, then Michael chose her family over her husband. And I personally think that that's something that happens just as often as choosing our comforts over our husbands. It's choosing our family. Wives, you will not win that war if you choose yourself or your family over your husband. You cannot serve two masters, right? You will grow to love one and hate the other. That's what Jesus said. It's his words, right? Now, he's talking about money and following money or God, but I think it applies to so much. I think it applies to serving our families versus serving our husbands, right? We all know Ephesians 5. We all know that we're not supposed to pick ourselves over our husbands, right? Submit yourselves to, you know, to your husbands. We're not the master. But we go back with families because sometimes we justify families more. But they're my family, okay? So we'll go back to the beginning, Genesis 2.24. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is marriage 101, right? And it's not just the man leaving his father and mother. It's the woman leaving her father and mother and becoming one with her husband, right? Be joined. The King James Version says, cleave unto, right? You cleave unto your, your wife or your husband. It means being united, holding fast, clinging together. Uh, two people, no one else is involved. It's just you two against the world, right? He's your number one top priority, supreme concern, numero uno. Not your parents, not your friends, not your siblings, not even your children. Nothing is supposed to come between you two. Um, when Michael chose to stay, that little crack from that lie about her husband became a big old fissure. <laughs> uh, when you allow those splits, those cracks, when you divide your loyalty, um, gosh, it's so easy from there on to just keep cracking and fall apart, right? something to come between you. So I thought, okay, Lord, what can come between two people in a marriage other than things and stuff and jobs? People. I was thinking of people. Children. Children are such a big thing, right? Because they're such a huge part of our lives. We're supposed to love them. We're supposed to give them attention and our, um, you know, our focus and so much about us. We're supposed to love them. Babies especially. 
brand new babies. They will not survive if you do not pay attention to them, right? Uh, they need everything from you. But as they grow, as they start to get out of the season of needing you 24-7, um, you need as a parent, most of you guys know, you've all been through it, right? But um, you need to establish boundaries with your children already early on to protect your marriage. Examples that I have written down are bedtimes. <laughs> as a mom, I can't tell you how important it is with little kids to have bedtimes. Put them to bed, not when you go to bed. Before you go to bed, not only does every single study in America show how much sleep a little kid needs, but how much time you get to now have with your husband to connect in the evenings without 15 little voices pulling at your attention and things. Now that you have 15 kids, whoa. But Jean wanted 15 kids, it didn't happen, but yeah. I'm just saying that you need that time. Uh, another part with bedtimes is separate beds. Family sleeping together in a big old bed. One, how do you get to have a family in the first place? I don't know, but that's another question. But truly, truly, I can't tell you how many families that are like, oh, yeah, we just let all our kids sleep with us. And you're like, really? Where is that intimacy between you and your husband? Where is that alone time of just being an adult and breathing, right? And, you know, I understand a thunderstorm or a nightmare or someone's sick. That's different. Just like with babies, there's a season. But not letting them share your bed every night is very important. And if you don't believe me, ask your husband. Because <laughs> it's not usually the husband's idea to let the kids all sleep in bed, is it? It's usually always the wife going, oh, honey, they need, you know, I'll, they'll sleep on my side. It's okay. The husband's like, <laughs> right? Just ask him, right? Ask him, honey, is this on? Oh, yeah, that'd be great if they could sleep in their own beds. Is it hard? Yes so hard to get kids sleep trained and it doesn't go away you constantly sleep train my 10 year old sometimes i have things of what are you doing out of bed right you're 10 you know better than anybody else but there are helps for that and if that's something you want counseling for i know a hundred people that could go you th walk you through some steps on those kinds of things but i also have things on date nights and weekends away just making that time to make your husband a priority and not allowing your children to become the sole glue between the two of you because we've seen over and over again when the children eventually leave which they're supposed to what happens all of a sudden you've got a super deep crack and the two of you don't know how you fit together anymore don't let that happen stop that crack before it comes right Parents are another thing that people can allow in between their relationships, like Michael and her father, right? My mom uh, and dad used to be a part of this big conglomeration of stuff called enjoying marriage. Anyway, I remember because when I was a little kid, it was Monday nights or, or Thursday nights or premarital counseling. And so the three of us little girls got to go upstairs and watch whatever we wanted to on TV. Usually it was Full House, the original, right? Because John Stamos was so cute. And Sarah always wanted to watch Rescue 911. And so our biggest fights were over, do we watch Rescue 911 or do we watch Full House? But in any case, we'd be uh, ensconced upstairs and my parents would hold premarital counseling in our living room. And then inevitably in the spring, we'd be invited to 400 weddings because my parents did all their premarital counseling. I went to more weddings as a kid than anybody should ever have a right to go to. So, uh, but I remember one of the lessons, I always heard my parents telling other people, was this lesson with rings, how you throw a, a rock into a lake and it ripples outwards, right? And you see all these different little rings going. And I, I'm probably telling you this totally wrong, but this is how my seven-year-old heart interpreted it. And I've always taken it to heart, where when a man and a woman get married, they become the new center ring and everyone else gets pushed outwards, including your parents. Your parents are now the outer ring. They're no longer part of the inner ring, which has some big... Uh, ramifications there. One, you don't obey your parents anymore. You don't. You're an adult and you are married to someone. So when your parents give you an order, you look at them and say, mom and dad, I love you. No. <laughs> you can tell your parents no. It's amazing. You know, you're still honoring your parents, yes, and you're still, you know, they're still important to you, but you are now your own part of this thing. And then when your kids get married, you know, right now they're part of your little inner ring, right? They're with you. But then when they get married, they form their own ring and you get pushed back. 
And you have to recognize your place now is outside of the ring. You, don't, you should not be making decisions for your married children. You really shouldn't. You shouldn't allow yourself to be the one because you're going to cause a crack. You're going to cause a crack between the two of them and make it even harder for them. you got to watch that. Let them be their own thing. Yes, you be there. Nurture them. If they're asking you for advice, give it. If they're asking you for advice, give it, right? But allow them to start this family. They need that unity together. With, when you're married, you don't share everything with your parents anymore. You don't share every secret. You don't share every vacation or holiday. Uh, you guys get it, right? You're your own family unit. You also don't let friends or siblings into that marriage that you and your husband have. You don't allow them to take priority. And as, as, as much as we say, oh, wow, my, of course I love my husband more than my friends. Really? When your friends call, do they get first priority every time? Does everyone else get put on hold because your friend called? Or uh, your husband would really like to talk to you about something, and it's, oh, sorry, hon, hang on. Oh, <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. All of a sudden he goes to bed because he just can't even talk to you. You're gone with whatever it is. Um, do their opinions hold more weight than his does? Okay, that's one thing I've learned. If I'm going to ask my husband his opinion, and he gives it, I sure as heck better be really sure about not following it if I don't take his advice. Because let me tell you, that is one thing that frustrates my husband so bad, is when I ask him something, and he tells me, and then I do the opposite. Or I ask him something, and I don't like what he says, so I ask someone else, and then I take their advice, because that's really what I wanted to hear anyway right? I dare you. The next time you say, honey, does this dress look good? And he's like, I love it. Do it. And you're like, mm, wear it. Shut your mouth. Wear the dress. Who cares if it's ugly? None of your friends will matter, right? And then that, your, your husband will just be walking tall because you wore the dress he picked, right? Or you cut the way, your hair the way he wanted it done. You honor your husband in those little things instead of your friends or your siblings or whoever it is, social media, right? None of them care about you like he does. Follow his opinions, right? establishing boundaries, leaving and cleaving, precious wives. I feel like if Michael had jumped out that window after David, the rest of her story would have been really different. <sighs> Instead, we find some really harsh consequences. She's now stuck at home, and David is gone. For nine years, he's gone. Now, I don't think she had any idea that he'd be gone that long. I think she thought, like, before her dad would calm down, He'd cool off, and then David would come back. That's what had happened before. But this was it. This was a straw that broke the camel's back. David is gone now. Gone. And what does her father do? Now, one, he's nuts. Okay, Saul's crazy. But he also knows his daughter. He feels betrayed by her. Even though she stayed, he feels betrayed by her. And we find in 1 Samuel 25, I'm just going to read you one verse there. It's 1 Samuel 25, verse 44, the very last verse there. It says, but Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to another man, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. She was given by her dad to another man to go be his wife. I just don't even know how to respond to that. You know, one, Saul knows exactly what he's doing. Michael's married, and he's pretending like it never happened, and he gives her to somebody else. He found a way to hurt both David and Michael and also to punish her for her taking uh, David's side. And he also, Saul's a crazy genius, he found a way to remove David's link from his throne. No, you can't do it through Michael. Michael's married to Paul T. Michael's not married to you anymore, right? Now, the weird thing is, is that's not the end of Michael's story. She gets married to this other guy. Now, later on, years pass, Saul dies Okay, his son takes over the throne, her brother. So now she's no longer a princess, right? She had this whole security of being the daughter of her father, but now her father's gone. Her brother's the king, but that makes her nothing. She's not a princess. She's not a queen. She's just married to this other guy, Palti. Well, David has become the king now in Judah. So Saul's son is still the king of the northern kingdoms. David's become the king of the southern kingdoms. And there's some political maneuvering that goes along in here. And so uh, David has this opportunity to ask for something, to ask for kind of whatever he wants from the northern kingdom. And do you know what he asks for? He asks for Michael. 
kind of interesting. So we're going to flip now to 2 Samuel, flip a whole book. You're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13, okay? So verse 13, 2 Samuel chapter 3, it says, And David said, Good, I'll make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you. You shall not see my face unless you bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michael, whom I betrothed to myself for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. He's like, I paid for her, she's mine, right? And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Then her husband went along with her to Baharim, weeping behind her. <laughs> so Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. So Michael is brought back to David. She's kidnapped, basically, from this husband who obviously loved her, that he followed her crying the whole entire way. Don't take my wife, right? And they're like, shut up, go home. Well, he does because he has no, he's going to get killed if he doesn't. Uh, but Michael comes back. And you think, oh, my goodness, like, what is this about? Is it because David just loved her and missed her so much? I don't think so. David, at this point, has six more wives and sons by these six other wives and daughters. He's got families upon families. He's got love, right? We don't know why. We don't know if it was, again, political maneuvering, again, giving him a way to access Saul's family, or maybe he really did love her. We don't know Michael's feelings. We don't know if she was sad to leave this weeping husband that she's been with for a very long time, or if now she's like, all right, well, I was a princess, and then I was nothing, and now I get to be a queen? I'm David's first wife. That means I get to come into this home, and I'm, pre I'm the main queen. I'm the queen bee, right? Okay, I'll go. I don't know. If she's that prima donna I picture, I picture her happy with this move, but I don't know. I really don't know. But something has changed. Michael and David have changed. They've grown up apart, not together, and they're different people now. And Michael comes to realize that she no longer has the feelings for her husband that she did when they first got married. Flip over to chapter 6, 2 Samuel 6, verse 16. We pick up here. Uh, David is now the king of everywhere. He's the king of all of Israel, okay? And he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back home to Jerusalem. It's a big celebration. They've been feasting and celebrating and sacrificing, and it's been amazing. This is like a highlight of David's kingship. Um, finally just getting all this stuff that God promised him. Um, in verse 16, it says, Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Basically, he's having a really good day. He gives everyone food and drink, and it's just a big party, right? Verse uh, 19, or 20. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. And she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly covers himself. Basically, she goes, dude, you were like naked out there, and you're dancing, and what, all the women are supposed to love you and fall all over you? Like, who do you think you are? That was so unroyal. Like, she has this attitude of what you just did was so unkingly. You should be ashamed of yourself, is what she says, right? So then David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over all the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. They're both snippy here. And if you think David's like any better than she is, he's not. Because you see what he throws in her face? Her dad. 
You know who chose me over your dad? God did. And if you think I lose naked, you just wait, girl. You wait and see how naked I can get, right? I mean, he's like all sorts of mad about what she did to him. But uh, it's very interesting. And I think, oh my gosh, this coldness. Again, was it because she was so prima donna and she's really nitpicking this, you know, outfit that he chose to wear, that she was worried about her reputation, right? Like, oh, you are such a base king. You're so common. Like, nobody would really do that if they were royal, right? I don't know if that was her attitude so much. But, um, I mean, that is her attitude, but I don't know if that was her pure motivation. I think maybe the years apart had something to do with it. I think maybe the fact that he never came back for her had something to do with it. Nine years, nine years, and you didn't ever once check up in on me? You never once called? Instead, you just married a whole bunch of other people <laughs> and had kids? Like, without me? You know, we, we have this imagination, right? Every Hallmark movie where the girl's going to marry the wrong man. And where do you? He bursts in the back door. I object, right? And she runs down and they run off because they were always supposed to be together. He didn't show up at her wedding. Do you think that hurt a little bit, that he wasn't there to object? <laughs> Probably. I, I, I mean, pff, I'd be stinking mad. And let's just say your husband shows up on Sunday in a Speedo and starts dancing in the front up here before the Lord. Aren't you and I going to have something to say about that? We have a problem if his shirt's buttoned wrong, okay? Like, not so much, my husband doesn't wear button shirts for that very reason. No, I'm just kidding. But if he's up here in a Speedo dancing before the Lord, yeah, I'm going to have something to say about that. So, I mean, I can't really fault Michael for everything she's saying, but there's a bitterness to it. There's something underneath everything she's saying. Bitter roots, right? Her coldness and her bitterness had continued that split. And that's something that can happen to us too, ladies. And I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about any relationship. You allow something that went wrong. You allow that bitter root in there. You know what roots do, right? Have you ever been walking down one of our Montrose sidewalks? (laughs) You hit a gap that's like three feet. If anything, walk down South 7th Street, okay? Walk South 7th Street sidewalk right by Townsend. There's this one gap whenever my kids and I walk down there. I'm serious. It's like two feet. It's like the sidewalk just jumps. Why? Because there was a big old cottonwood tree on the other side of that, and those roots came in, and they pushed that concrete up. Roots? Oh, my goodness. They can take out water tanks. They can take out dams. They can take out anything. (laughs) Roots are strong. And when you even allow the teeniest little bitter seed to just stay there, that one thing they said that one time, or that one way that they hurt you that one time. The truth of the matter is, ladies, we can do that with God. When God let us down and we thought, God, you didn't come through for me that one time, we allow little seeds, those little bitter roots to start. And then when the next time comes, we say, I don't know if I can really trust God because he didn't come through last time, right? He wasn't there this time. Or I don't know that I can trust my husband for this because, gosh, he he didn't come through for me that time. He didn't help me that time. And we allow those bitter roots to come in. Those bitter roots are going to break you up. (laughs) Just finish it. They finished it for her. Even a queen can have bitter roots that just demolish a relationship. And that's what it did. She allowed her bitterness to come out snotty and demeaning. And it just, their marriage was over. I, you know, I, I really think if she had come at it a different way, if she had done things, there could have been a reconciliation between her and David. Um, but there wasn't because they allowed the rest to just break the rest open, those bitter roots, right? Bitterness has consequences, and her consequences was she had no children to the day of her death. And I don't know, she had already been barren, right? She hadn't had kids with David already, and she hadn't had kids with Paltiel already. Uh, so maybe she was already barren, and maybe at this point David said, I got other wives, I don't need you. I'm never going to call you to my chamber. We're, we're done. You know, and she just lives in the harem for the rest of her life. But there's one more verse about Michael. Sorry, we'll go quickly. There's one more verse about her that I had never read. Well, I'm sure I read it because I've read the Bible, but I'd never noticed it before in relations to her. So I was like, oh, man. And as I have this attitude of her being this, this really was like, oh, man, that's so sad. I'll tell you. Okay, so I have to give you backstory so you know what's going on. Years have passed again, okay? 
and there's a famine in the land. It's this three-year-long famine. And David goes to the Lord and says, God, why are we having famine? Like, there, there must be something wrong. And God says, there is something wrong. When Saul was alive, he broke a very old oath. There was an oath between the Israelites and these people called the Gibeonites. And the oath was made by Joshua, so like hundreds of years before, saying, we won't kill you. You guys will be our allies. You know, you can even be our slaves. We won't kill you. That was the oath. Well, Saul, in his zeal for being godly, started murdering all the Gibeonites when he was alive. He killed tons of them. And now God is allowing this to come out, this famine, to say something's wrong in Israel. This oath, because God takes oaths very seriously, he said this oath was broken and it needs to be fixed. So David goes before the Gibeonites and says, hey, uh, I know Saul did this stuff. We need to make amends because God's basically punishing us. We need to, like, fix this. And so they say, okay, we don't want your gold. We don't want your, you know, we don't want to go to war. But what we do want is we want some of Saul's descendants. Uh, and in the passage, it says Saul and his bloodthirsty house killed the Gibeonites. So it wasn't just Saul himself. Members of his household were part of it, too. So they said, we want members of his household. We want seven of Saul's descendants, and we're going to put them to death. An eye for an eye, this is how we do justice, and this is how God does justice. So, uh, you know, give us seven of Saul's descendants, and we'll hang them, and then we'll be clean. Like, blood will atone, right? Because that's blood had to be paid. So David says, okay, I'll give you seven of Saul's descendants. And I'm like, huh. So here's where it is. It's in, hold on two seconds. It's in all the way over in chapter 21. So you can see how much time is passing. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 21, where David avenges the Gibeonites. And we're going to jump down to verse 7. It says, but the king spared Mephibosheth. Now this is one of Saul's descendants. David had already made an oath to him, saying, "Uh, you're going to be safe. I'm going to take care of you. You won't die. And so David had made his own oath there, so he can't break that oath. So he only has seven other people left as an option, right? So it says in verse 8, So the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, who were two sons of Rizpah, who she bore to Saul, so two of Saul's sons, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzali, the Mehotholite. Adriel was married to her sister, Merab. Remember that oldest daughter of Saul that was supposed to be given to David? She was given to this guy named Adriel, and she had five sons. Well, she apparently died, and so did her husband, leaving these five sons orphans. So you know who adopted them and brought them up? Michael did. Michael. And you read this, and you say, the five sons of Michael... So David took those five sons that she had raised and Saul's other two and gave them to the Gibeonites to be hanged. And I go, oh, like, David, was that really necessary? I mean, you and Michael were already on the outs. She already was never seeing you. And you went and took her five, her five nephews that she raised as her sons, and you let them be murdered? Yeah, he did. And I go, Oh, God, what are we supposed to learn from Michael's life? Like, not I don't look at her so much as this diva princess. I pity her. All because she chose her family, still choosing her family, over her husband and over God's family. And I think, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. If Michael had made some different... No, she wasn't responsible for everything that happened to her. She really wasn't. Neither are you and I. We're not responsible for every bad decision or every bad thing that happens to us. Sometimes that's outside of our control. But she had instances where she could have chosen and made different choices. She could have jumped out that window and went with David into the wilderness. And I just think all this could have been so different. It could have turned out so different. She also could have not allowed bitterness to kill her love for her husband. She could have come back to him humble and been a part of his family. And who knows that she wouldn't have had a connection with David to where they would have had more sons together. And she would have had other ones too. And not just these five that had belonged to her sister. 
And I think, all right, Lord, what are our lessons here? Definitely to wives. You know, as we look at wives in these next few weeks, there's going to be a lot spoken to us as wives. But I think also just to us as women. Watching our relationships. Watching for cracks in those important relationships in our lives. Even our relationship with Jesus and not allowing cracks. Not allowing things that we say that we do to crack it. And not allowing bitterness to come in and split it wide open. Because when we choose for ourselves or we choose for our families and our things, we lose out on so much of what God has for us and what God has for our families. Watch out for those things that would crack you apart. And remember that even bitterness can destroy a queen. Don't let those roots grow. As uplifting and wonderful as that story was, that's who God had us focus on for tonight. And so next week, I don't know if we're going to handle two of David's wives. I kind of want to put them together, but we may end up just be looking at one of David's most beautiful, incredible wives named Abigail. So that's who we're going to look at next week. My plan is, as soon as we wrap up the the study on David's wives, we're going to have a night of discussion. We're going to go into some of these wives and some of their characteristics, and we'll get into groups, and we'll kind of talk about it. That way you guys can even share maybe even stories of your own where you saw these kind of truths play out, or maybe even consider sharing an area where you found bitterness in your heart, and you had to have the Lord take his little trowel and dig it out of there so that you could seal up those cracks. Um, So that's my plan at the moment. I don't know exactly when the discussion night will be. It'll be again after we finish this little section of David's wives. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll close. Father, we're so (laughs) heavy hearted sometimes at these women that you show us, Lord. I, I just, my heart breaks for Michael. It pities her, Lord. I look at her marriage and what it could have been. And Father, I know that there are those of us here, Lord, who struggle in our own marriages. And we want them to succeed. And we want them to be beautiful, Lord. And sometimes they're just not. Father, would you help us to find our parts? Not the parts that our husbands are responsible for. Would you speak to them about that? But Lord, to us, would you help us to find areas where maybe we're not supporting? Maybe we're choosing someone else over them. Or even choosing someone over you, Lord. Would you root out those parts of us? Um, Help us, Father, to be to be women who are proud to be called by your name, women who will cleave to their husbands, Lord, and show this world what marriage is supposed to look like. Father, for any of the Michaels who are out there, Lord, who are already broken and bitter and maybe have lost everything, Lord, would you show them that their road hasn't ended yet, that you still have the power to pick those pieces up together and put them into a new form, Lord, into a new way? God, you are so mighty and powerful. Father, if there's any woman here that's struggling with seeds of bitterness against you because maybe you disappointed them somehow or didn't come through the way they expected, Lord, help them to work through those things. Maybe, I don't know what it is, Lord, I don't, and I don't know what you need to do, but Father, touch those roots and heal them. Get rid of them, Lord. Be faithful in their lives, Lord, so that they can look at you with 100% trust and confidence that you love them and that you've got the best plan for them. Dear Jesus, we just give you our weeks, and we thank you again, Spirit, for speaking to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.